Prime Sports. Todd Quarter here in Atlanta. JJ on the other side of the ATL. Wayne, our producer in Memphis, Tennessee, and our special guest this evening is uh, David Walker, former Texas A&M quarterback, All-Southwest Conference Freshman of the Year, who covers college football uh, in, in the Southeastern Conference for the Rebel, Rebel Walk. And, uh, David, it's an honor to have you here this evening. Uh, JJ, uh, glad to hear your voice, and uh, Wayne, glad to hear yours, too. Uh, we're all very excited. We know with SEC Media Days that uh, it's very, very close to college football season as we're a little over, what, uh, 35, 40 days uh, from kickoff, and I cannot wait. I know that, David, that the Old Miss will be here against Louisville on uh, Labor Day weekend. I believe that's on Labor Day night on Monday. Um, and I cannot wait for that contest. And, uh, David, once again, welcome to the show. Todd, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're looking forward to that first game in Atlanta. And uh, Louisville's got themselves a pretty good quarterback. As everybody knows, Ole Miss does too. So that's going to be a really good quarterback matchup, I think. Looking well, forward to speaking, it. Speaking of quarterbacks, let's just get right into it then, uh, Matt Corral, 6'1", uh, 205 junior. He led the nation in total offense last year for Ole Miss, 384 yards a game uh, with Lane Kiffin as the head coach and Jeff Libby as the OC. Uh, can Matt Corral maybe, you know, upset some few teams along the way and put Ole Miss in a position to win its uh, last league, uh, to win its first league title since 1963? Is there an outside well, shot of that? He, uh, Matt Crouch, one heck of a quarterback. You know, he's coming back this year uh, as the uh, leading quarterback in uh, QBR, which is uh, a metric that ESPN keeps. It's uh, very accurate. And uh, he was third overall last year behind uh, Mac Jones and Justin Fields, you know, two first-round picks uh, in the NFL draft. And uh, behind him were Zach Wilson and Kyle Trask, Trevor Lawrence, and Ian Brooke. So, you know, he's right in there with the class of the country in terms of QBR. In fact, he's a good eight or nine points ahead of anybody coming up, uh, coming back this season uh, behind him, including Spencer Rattler. And, of course, we all know Rattler right now is the number one guy for uh, the Heisman in, uh, in the betting odds anyway. And uh, from Oklahoma. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, we're going to see some really good things out of Matt Corral before this season's over. Now, how far he can take Ole Miss, you know, that's another question. But, uh, you know, if you're looking for a guy who can do it all, run, throw, throw any kind of pass, uh, uh, and, and make the plays on, on third down when they've got to be made, you know, Matt Corral's the guy. I'm really looking forward to watching him play. You're listening to David Walker right here on ATL Prime Sports. You can check David out at the Rebel Walk and on Twitter at David Walker QB. Well, we're going to go over. A lot of people think Matt Corral is the best returning quarterback in the SEC. I beg to differ. I think it's the guy in Athens, JT Daniels. What do you think about JT Daniels and the dogs' chances in the East this year, David? Oh, they're very good. Um, you know, I think uh, JT Daniels, I just haven't seen enough of him yet. Uh, you know, he really didn't even qualify for QBR last year. Uh, everybody says he's a great, great quarterback and uh, going to lead Georgia to the promised land this year. And, of course, you know, they say a lot about Georgia. And uh, I think they uh, start the season with Clemson. And uh, Clemson also has a new quarterback coming in. So, uh, I think the spread on that game right now is Clemson minus four. And it's just uh, going to be, a, you know, just a tremendous matchup for uh, for the country watching these two teams get together so early in the season. But uh, there's no doubt, yeah. Now, he's going to have to prove it. You know, he hasn't proven anything yet. So uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of people who are in his corner. I think he's already fourth or fifth in the Heisman race. So, uh Apparently, people who know what they're talking about are putting some money on it. You, you know, when talking about J.T. Daniels there, um, 
It, it, you know, he only had four starts after replacing Stetson Bennett last year. He threw for over 200, you know, 1,200 yards in the USC transfer. Now he's going to get a full season in Todd Munskin's offense. He threw for 10 touchdowns, did uh, JT, in those four games. You know, I, I expect a slight change in Georgia's offense. Um, I don't. It, the slight change for me would be, I think once Georgia gets to that 40, 50 yard line, they're going to start taking more deep cracks downfield, try to stretch the defense out, and meanwhile mix in that power running game in between. I think Georgia is going to start airing it out, kind of like the old Oakland Raiders did with Kenny Stabler back in the '70s. Get to the 40 or 50 yard line and start <laughs> chucking it deep. What do you think, David? Yeah, that's a that's a real possibility. I think that they may have a little bit of a offense adjustment that they need to make. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say that the offense is has uh, not not been everything that it could be at Georgia. And, uh, you know, it really looks like they've got the man under center or or at least in the shotgun uh, that can get things done for them. So it's going to be really interesting. I, you know, they're only four point underdogs against Clemson. So that's going to be a great, great game and a kind of a, a good a good way to uh, uh, perhaps forecast what the season is going to be for Georgia. Um, you know what, um, David, you know, moving over to Missouri, uh, Connor Bezalak, uh, you know, he was the SEC co-freshman uh, of the year. He completed 67% of his passes for about 2,300 yards, uh, for, you know, 6'3", 220-pound uh, uh, sophomore coming up this year. He's one of the three big returning quote-unquote guys. Uh, what do you think of Connor's game, and, and, and can he make a big jump to his sophomore year? You know, uh, the Missouri is one of those teams a lot of people think they can, you know, move up to the next level a little bit. Yeah, well, it's um, a lot of that is so dependent on the scheme that you run and uh, the people that you have around you. You know, you've got to have that great running back, which Alabama always seems to have. You've got to have those great receivers. And, uh, you know, if he has people around him and they have the scheme that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, applicable to uh, uh, making big yards and scoring a lot of points, then I think Missouri and, and he may have a, uh, a chance of doing something big this year at times against certain teams. But, uh, you know, they got a ways to go yet. You're listening to David Walker right here on ATL Prime Sports. Dave, I'm gonna David, I'm gonna shift it back over to Ole Miss. Ole Miss lost a lot in the receiving corps last year. Who will Matt Carroll be throwing the ball to this year? You know, you guys got a couple transfers. Let's talk about those. Well, they got uh, John Rice Plumley. I think is going to be one of the main uh, one of the main uh, guys out there going to that slot receiver, from what I understand. And uh, we all saw what he did his freshman year in the SEC in terms of carrying the football. And then uh, we got to see him in the bowl game against Indiana whenever they had to have a big play. Uh, you know, they, they ran him on the wheel route out of the backfield. And uh, Indiana just lost him and, uh, you know, made some couple of really big catches there at the end of the game uh, to salt that one away for, uh, for Ole Miss. So a lot of people, I mean, we're looking for uh, – uh, you know, lost your boy, the tight end. We think we can probably replace him. And, uh, you know, you're looking at an offensive scheme that's just uh, unstoppable. Um, you know, last year, uh, you know, anytime it was third and 15, third and 20, that seemed to be what Ole Miss likes the most. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that offense work again. Uh, you know, running game, throwing game. Uh, Banking, you know, you worry about on uh, on defense, of course, that Ole Miss is, uh, you know, whether they're going to have one or not. And uh, they lost a really good linebacker in John Chris Jones, who transferred to Kentucky uh, during the off season, and uh, you know they're going to have to build on that. But uh, this is a team that was tied 42-42 with uh, Alabama last year, and uh, gave everybody else fits. So uh, I think that. Uh, uh, I don't think receivers, I don't think the running back, I think Edie's going to be really good. I don't think the running back is going to be any any issue. And uh, their offensive line pretty much back intact. So they're looking at, uh, it's it's like uh, Matt Corral said in an interview, they're loaded. And uh, we're just going to see how far that offense can take them. 
All right. Hey, Dave, uh, this is Wayne in Memphis. I uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, as far Thank as you, the Wayne. SEC opening uh, games, it looks like Tennessee gets to kick everything off uh, two days before everybody else. But uh, Ole Miss is going to be the last game versus Louisville on the 6th. Uh, how does that affect a quarterback? Uh, he sits and watches all the other games in his conference, uh, opening games, and then he goes out and is, you know, the last opening game. Do you think that's something that affects how he plays, or do you think it's not even a big deal? Well, you know, that's a really good question. Um, you know, if it's me, you know, back whenever I was playing in the 70s, we didn't have hardly anybody to watch. You know, we, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were like, there was like one football game on a Saturday. We played in about two or three games a season. Uh, that were televised, but um, you know I think he's going to be concentrating primarily in that hotel room on uh, on his own game plan, and I'm I'm not really sure how much of the other games that they'll even watch. Um, but I, I you know LSU and UCLA is going to be a really interesting game as we talked about uh, Clemson and Georgia. Uh, Alabama's got Miami. You know on paper it may not be a very close game, but still there's going to be a lot of uh, people looking at. Uh, Bryce Young, you know, the new quarterback over there for Alabama. We don't know what he's got yet because we haven't seen anything of him. So, uh, and, uh, of course, you got Max Johnson at LSU, the left-hander, who I think is going to get the job and probably do very well. So there's going to be, uh, there'll be some scouting going on, but I don't think that uh, Matt Crowell is going to be comparing himself to uh, anybody else. Uh, you know, he, he's head and shoulders above everybody right now. And I think he's going to be concentrating more on what he's got to get done than what everybody else is doing out there. Hey, David, speaking of that, we're talking about the first three quarterbacks, Corral, Daniels, and Basilak, the returning quarterbacks. The last big name of the returning quarterbacks in the Southeastern Conference is Bo Nix at Auburn. And, you know, he's going to have (laughs) a competition against T.J. Finley, who has a fantastic arm. Uh, You know, the offensive line, to be fair to Nix last year, was inconsistent. He did take a step back. Um, it's a per, first part, a three-part question, actually. Uh, you mentioned the other two parts, and I'll have you expand on that in a second. Um, you know, who wins that Auburn job, in your opinion? And then um, if you could uh, you talk about Bryce Young a little bit more. He did step in a little bit and filled in last year for Alabama. And then you mentioned at the end, uh, you know, LSU's quarterback situation, which is a competition. LSU's Ed Orgeron said, you know, we have two championship quarterbacks, Miles Brennan last year in three games, 1,100 yards, 11 TDs, but he had that abdominal injury. And then, of course, right. Max Johnson, which is a son of former NFL quarterback Brad Johnson. He started the final three games against Bama, Florida, and Ole Miss. He led him to a 2-1 record, six touchdowns, and one interception. Uh, expand on all that for me. Uh, who do you think wins what job where? You already thought that Max Johnson will get it at LSU. Well, yeah, I think Max Johnson and the bloodlines that you mentioned uh, with his father uh, playing uh, had, a, had a long career in the NFL and did really well. Um, and, you know, so he, he's got that. Um uh, you know, they brought a couple of guys in who uh, worked with Joe Brady when Joe was there, whenever they were winning the national championship uh, in 2019. And uh, Coach Insminger is retired. And, you know, things just weren't, uh, oh, until the end of the season anyway, things weren't, uh, weren't jiving really well at LSU as they had the year before. And I think that uh, Coach Orgeron probably made the only move that he could and uh, bringing these two other guys in now who uh, were with Joe Brady for a year in the NFL. And, um, you know, with uh, Coach Ensminger retiring and everything. And going back to the offense that won on the national championship in 2019, I, I, think, it'll be, I think it'll be Johnson in there. Uh, he looked really good whenever I saw him at the end of the season last year. Um, you know, as far as Bo Nix is concerned, I remember driving back from Memphis uh, after the uh, Ole Miss-Memphis game that opened the season two years ago. And uh, Bo Nix was quarterbacking, and, and we were kind of watching on uh, on our on our phones. We were watching the game against Oregon, and, and it was his first start as a freshman and, and uh, brought him back for a big win at the end. And it was just uh, – uh, I, I always thought Bo Nixon was uh, a heck of a quarterback. 
And, uh, you know, he's had his ups and downs at Auburn. Um, you know, now they had a coaching change, and we're going to see, uh, uh, and like you said, Finley heading over there from LSU. I mean, that's – and I think they both have uh, uh, NIL deals working <laughs> right off the bat. So, uh, apparently, uh, you know, they're both highly respected there in Auburn. And, and uh, I'm looking at the odds, and I see that uh, Ole Miss is actually uh, – uh, a better favorite than Auburn is this year in terms of uh, winning the uh, SEC. So we'll just have to see how uh, how it all shakes out. It's hard to say, but, you know, I'm going to stick with Bo Nitz at Auburn. You know, I think he's going to finish his career there as a starter. And um, I don't know how successful they're going to be uh, in the early going, but uh, uh, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Bo Nitz there and, and uh, Johnson at LSU. You know, if you could expand a little bit on Bryce Young, I, I mentioned him from 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 Alabama. You know, he uh, you know a sophomore uh, last year, limited action, thirteen to twenty two, one fifty six, and a TD. You know, it, this is a lot, Alabama's a lot more question marks this year than 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 prior years. Um, you know, can I mean it's a lot to ask for somebody to step in and limit an action and, 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 and try to defend a national championship, even though this is really a separate team than it was from a year ago. Uh talk about that just for a minute briefly. Yeah, well, you know, everybody at the beginning of last year, uh, you know, a lot of people expected Bryce Young to just step in, um, uh, you know, and, and kind of forgot about Mac Jones and um uh, you know, Mike Jones had only played sparingly the year before. Uh, you know, when Tua got hurt, he went in and, and didn't do particularly well his first game, but then had a heck of a bowl game. And uh, it was at that moment that I thought that, uh, you know, this Mike Jones guy is pretty good. Well, Mike Jones has the all-time highest QBR uh, in the history of the metric. And that thing's been going on since, like, 2005 or 2006. So for 15 years. So, uh, you know, Bryce was playing behind arguably the best quarterback that we've seen in the last 15 years at Matt Jones. And uh, so there's a lot you take away. I played behind an all-state quarterback when I was in high school my junior year he, when he was a senior. And, uh, you know, there's just so much that you pick up, so much that you uh, uh, better understand when you're playing behind somebody of that caliber. And, uh, you know, getting that year, uh, to be an understudy to Mac Jones is just going to do wonders for Bryce. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be uh, it's good. and again, you know, he's like second or third in the Heisman voting and hadn't really taken a snap as a starter. So, you know, apparently all the talent in the world is there uh, uh, with him and around him. So, uh, you know, they do have a new OC this year. You know, the former Houston coach and. And uh, but I don't expect the offense to change any. I mean that offense has been there now for uh, several years since Lane Kiffin, uh, you know, years there. So uh, they're they're just tough to stop. Tough to stop. They had a great recruiting year. They had 13 great great signees coming in, which is like double what they normally get in the top 60. And uh, you know, it just looks like Nick Saban is just going to keep on keeping on. But uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this quarterback can do. I didn't get to see him hardly at all last year because, you know, of course, Mac Jones was playing and it was a shortened season. And, uh, you know, you're playing all conference games, so you don't get to really, uh, you know, you don't play the Kent States or the Prairie A&Ms or the other people and and uh, every game the conference game. And so I'm looking to see what he can do. But I guarantee you last year as an understudy, was a big year for him. I expect him to just step in, and uh, they won't see any difference whatsoever. All right, we're going to some teams here, uh, David, with some you know some new starters at quarterback. There are three of them: A and M, Florida, and Mississippi State. I'll start with A and M. As you know, Kellen Mond, they're going to have to replace him. There's competition between Haynes King, Zach Calzada, and freshman Eli Stowers. And, uh, you know, they've only got one offensive lineman returning. But, they, you know, they have A&M right there as a top five, six team in the country. That's really a lot for, um, for Fisher and company to, to replace and not only, you know, try to win the SEC West, 
but to stay in the upper echelon of the division because this is the best division in college football. And then when you talk about Florida, you know, they've got that dual threat Emory Jones replacing Kyle Trask. He's had spot duty for three years, so those questions for them. And then my last one would be old Mrs. Rival, Mississippi State. You, you, you know, Will Rogers started the last three games last year. And then you've got Southern Miss transfer Jack Abram. And then South Alabama transfer Czech, uh, excuse me, Chance uh, Lovertech. So, you know, this is really interesting. You, you've got these three clubs. They're all supposed to be really good. But they have question marks at a very important position. Yeah, when you look at a and I mean, you know, uh, Kellen Mond uh, passed me last year. I was second in total wins at the school. When I left there, I was the leader. And uh, he passed me And uh, as far as uh, becoming the second winningest quarterback at A&M. And it seems like Kellen was there for about 10 years. And I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think Haynes King is probably going to end up getting that job. And and, uh, they, you know, they got a great running back behind him. He showed a lot, I thought, in the North Carolina game when he was named the uh, the player of the game. And so, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, Jimbo loves to run the football, you know, and he's always got a really good tailback. So, you know, they'll be lining up in that pro set, and they'll be running that ISO and, and then running play action and doing all the stuff that Jimbo likes to do. Uh, you know, keeping it conservative, keeping your defense out on the field, and, and trying to run a lot of clock. And um, uh, I, I think it's a Jimbo factor probably more than anything that has a and ranked as high as they are. And uh, not losing but one game last year, and that was Alabama. And uh, even though they've lost quite a bit, they do have an All-American offensive lineman coming back. They've got an All-American defensive lineman coming back. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're – their defense has improved from what it was, you know, under uh, under uh, Sumlin uh, when it was really so bad. And so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, they're going to remain pretty conservative and they're going to play defense, and that's just kind of like the A and M way under under Jimbo. Um, speaking of uh, Florida State, um, you know, McKenzie. I really hope McKenzie does well over there because, you know, he took uh, when he was at Central Florida, boy, what a what a blow. Uh, I recall that injury that he had to the leg, and, uh, you know, I'm just glad to see that he's back. McKenzie Milton was a heck of a quarterback at Central Florida. And, Absolutely. Uh, going to FSU, I think he's going he's gonna to have a great chance there to have a great, great season, and uh, I'm just glad to see him back in the game. I mean, that is that – is, uh, that is uh, really special, and uh, I'm pulling for that kid hard. Uh, over Florida, you know, I don't know. I mean, they're they're. I don't I don't think they're going to have the team that they had last year. Uh, you know, it doesn't appear. And um, you know, that's that's Georgia's division to have. Uh, Emory's going to, you know, he's 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 a good athlete and can get around, does a lot of things really well, and uh, is highly regarded. Um, you know, we have so many new quarterbacks that are coming in. Ohio State's got a new quarterback coming in, uh, you know, who was uh, the number two um, pro guy, you know, coming out of his class. And uh, it's really going to be interesting to see how all these new guys do. Um, you know, uh, Iowa State's got a heck of a quarterback in Purdy. North Carolina's guy, you know, he's in the conversation, everybody's conversation, Sam Howe, you know. And uh, so there's a lot of things that can that can go on in terms of the quarterback positions, and particularly in the SEC, but also around the country. It's going to be a heck of a year for quarterback watching. Oh, hey, David, I'm sorry, Mississippi State there, the last one. Uh, Will Rogers versus uh, Southern Miss transfer uh, Jack Abraham and South Alabama transfer uh, – uh, Chance uh, Lovertech there. W- w- who's going to win that one? I'm sorry, I gave you three of them there. I, I went too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Will Rogers is going to win that one. And, uh, you know, Coach Leach, I mean, I was really impressed with the way they came out last year, as everybody was, with that opening win. And it uh, looked like uh, the air raid was going to be the offense that uh, everybody thought it was going to be. And then all of a sudden it just got shut down. 
and um, you know, looking to see what kind of adjustments that he makes, and and uh, see if he can get them competitive again. Uh, you know, uh, 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 they're. they're <laughs> They've got they've got all the makings, you know. Coach Leach is one heck of a coach. I mean, he does a lot of things right, and uh, you know he's he's got that he's got his home play sheet on the back of a business card, you know. And I mean, I like that about a coach. And uh, he uh, uh, you know, he's brought a lot of brought a lot of good things to Mississippi State, but I think they also lost a lot of players, you know, a lot of transfers and and so forth. So. We're going to have to see how that all washes out there. But, uh, yeah, I think Will Rogers is the guy there. And, uh, you know, if they get this air raid straightened out, it's just an awful tough offense to run in the SEC against all these great defenses. You're listening to David Walker right here on ATL Prime Sports. You can find us on YouTube, folks. If you like the videos, give us a subscribe and a like at ATL Prime Sports on all social media. David, want to get into the national championship talk. Alabama is the defending champions. According to DraftKings, they're the favorite, a big favorite, 225. Clemson comes in at plus 300. Ohio State plus 400. Oklahoma and Georgia rounded out, rounded out the top five with plus 650 and plus 700. Who do you think wins the national championship if you had to put uh, one one – one bullet in the gun, fire off uh, as a favorite. Who do you like to w- win the national championship with these favorites, David? Yeah, those are those are the top five. And then, uh, you, you know, it's kind of funny if you go down, uh, you know, one more step, you have Texas and Texas A&M both at 25 to 1. So, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Georgia, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Clemson, Alabama, easily the top five in terms of uh, – you know what? What? What all the experts are saying, anyway? Uh, it's just going to be hard to knock Alabama off. You know, going to be hard to knock them off. And uh, you know, I think it'll probably be, even though, you know, even if you expand the field to 32, I think you'd still end up with uh, with uh, Alabama and Clemson being the top two. Yeah, and I'll actually expand on that question. You mentioned it, the expansion. What do you think of college football playoffs expanding? Would it be good? Would it be bad? Your opinion on that, David? Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I've, the only the only um, objection I've had to the current system is that um, it, it it takes away the meaning of championships. I mean, we were always taught that, you know, the champions are the ones who are going to get the opportunity to win it all. And when you have three of the five power five champions coming in, and then you have a runner up such as we had last year with Notre Dame, you know, I, I just think that that's bad for the game. I think you need to have all five power five champions in a playoff and then pick three other teams to come in. That's how I would set it up. I'd have your uh, maybe three group six champions or or your best uh, power five runner ups or something like that come in. But but you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta benefit the champions in this thing. And I don't think you even need a committee to do that. About the only thing you mm-hmm. should have a committee for is to seed them. And uh you know, I think you probably use the national polls to seed your top four. And uh, you know, go back to that. You know, back whenever we played, we didn't you know, whoever whoever got the most votes won. You know, there was no playoff. And so now, you know, you, you go to two and then you go to four, and that's all that's all good and dandy, but I, I'd make those four conference champions. That's That would be my only tweak. And uh, yeah, I'm, I, anybody else? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to agree with you. I, I think conference champions, and I, I do think there should be some automatic bids, especially for the five Power Five conferences. Um I think if you win your conference championship, you should be in. And uh, I agree with you there. I'll let I'll let you finish, David. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no, 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 not at all. And and that would be that would be my idea. And uh, so if you want to have eight teams, I mean, you know, go with your five power fives, go with three group of sixes, or any combination of uh, group six champions and uh, power five runner ups. And just let the polls decide them. I think we put way too much power in the hands of way far too few people. And, uh, you know, you have this selection committee that's made up of who, whomever, 
and uh, they're the ones who are deciding for the United States you know, who's going to be in this uh, in this playoff. I don't think we and, need and, them. You know what, I think David, that, can I say something real quick? It just seems like sometimes it's regional bias towards it. I, Luke, yes. I do like what you just stated before. Uh, you know, it's a much better way of doing it. A lot of people question people's motives when a lot of when people are, then that have that much power. But I mean, to me, we've had Dave Cohen on who does. Uh, we have him on a lot on our show. Who does play by play for Georgia State, and you know, he said, "What what about the group of five? With the twelve teams, you'll probably get one group of five in there. I, I doubt mm-hmm. you'll get for more than one." But these schools deserve some consideration, without a doubt. I'm with you 100. percent I'm with you 100. percent Otherwise, have a different tournament for them. Have a different playoff for them, because if they're not going to have a chance, you know, if they go 12 and 0 and they're not going to have a chance of getting in, then just have a different playoff. Have a, uh, you know, like in the state of Texas, you know, they have two divisions for each classification. They got a, a 6A. Uh, division one is six A Division two, and you know the college football could do the very same thing. If you're not going to give these other teams a chance at the championship, uh, then then let them create their own championship. It's like last year we were waiting to see whether it was going to be A and M or Notre Dame at fourteen, and uh, you know I'm thinking well neither one of them deserve to be in it. You know neither one of them won a championship. You know look at Oklahoma. You know, look at Southern Cal or whoever won the Pac-12 uh, Pac- Pac last year, even though they only played five or six games. But, you know, you got you to gotta look at the champions. You know, there's just uh, uh, just just no reason not to. Uh, that's, that's why you play the game is to win your conference. And then after you win your conference, you should be in the conversation. You know, that's, that's just my opinion. Oh, there's no doubt, David. We agree with you. Um, we got about, uh, we'll just say five minutes left in the show from now. Um, you know what? All three of us, J.J., Wayne, and I, all have the same question. There's this guy named, oh, gosh, oh, yeah, Arch Manning. He's the number one quarterback for the 2023 class. He's the number two overall player. He's related to, oh, yeah, Archie Manning, his grandfather. His dad is <laughs> Cooper Manning. And, oh, yeah, his uncle's. Uh, some guys named Eli and Peyton, who really did well in the NFL, along with Archie, obviously. The upcoming visit to Ole Miss on July 26th. He went to all the other summer camps this summer. All the big boys, Alabama, Clemson. There, in fact, he threw a touchdown pass at the Clemson camp that got a lot of PR uh, <laughs> to uh, DJ, uh, his brother, a wide receiver, who will be coming in. And twenty part of the uh, twenty twenty three quarterback uh, wide receiver class. We don't know where he's going to go yet. It looks like Clemson at this point. Um, but you know, DJ, I can't even pronounce his last name at Clemson. Uh, you know, he did really well last year, filling in for uh, Trevor Lawrence. So, what do you think, yeah, Arch? Man, for yeah, group- I mean, this is going to be sick. I think this will be the most recruited player in the history of college football. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the bloodlines. And also, uh, I saw where uh, Peyton and Eli are going to be doing Monday Night Football, too, on a, on a ESPN, too. That's yeah, right. that's going to be so cool. That's I'll be I'll be listening to them. You know, there's no doubt about that. You know, and I hope, I hope they hey, bring David, I'm right, I'm right there. there. I'm right there with you. I'll be listening to them. They'll be coinciding with the broadcast on ESPN and ABC. I think more people are going to tune in to Peyton and Eli than they are the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> I guarantee you. But, but back to Arch. I mean, Arch is, you know, that's going to be the big deal. That's going to be the big question. You know, you've got – you got Ole Miss. You have Alabama. You've got Texas. You've got uh, Clemson. I mean, there's, 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 and, and of course you got his home state LSU. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, just, just no telling right now. But uh, what a commodity! I mean, the size, the arm strength. Uh, he's got the high school coaching. He's got everything that he's going to need. And um, I, I think one thing's probably going to be for certain. Uh, and you know, he's from over there. Uh, my my old stomping grounds in Louisiana. One thing's for certain: he'll be looking for a place where he can win a national championship. 
And so uh, you're going to have to prove to him that you can do that. And there are a few schools who are after him who, who have already done it and have the uh, personnel there to, uh, to do it again. So if you can show that to him, then you got a shot at him. You're listening to David Walker right here on ATL Prime Sports. You can find David on Twitter at David Walker QB. My final question for the evening, I'm going to kind of blend a couple together. Ole Miss has a tough schedule. They do open up against Louisville here in Atlanta. We've mentioned that after two winnable games on the road at Alabama. Where do you see Ole Miss finishing the season? And I got to get a comment from you. Very interesting game on the schedule versus Liberty. Hugh Freeze comes into town, former Ole Miss coach. Got to get a comment on that game. And where do you see Ole Miss finishing the season? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just uh, that's going to be a golden game for both teams. With Hugh Freeze coming in. He's got an excellent quarterback there at Liberty. I mean, uh, the guy's QBR was up in the top ten last year. So that's going to be also a really good quarterback matchup. Um, you know, I think I think you're probably going to be looking at a – an eight-win season is probably what uh, most of the experts are going to be thinking, is, uh, or maybe even seven. But uh, you know, they're definitely going to definitely going to have a winning season. They'll definitely be going to a bowl game, and uh, you know, if they can surprise a few people, I've said all along that A and M dodged them last year. A and M dodged them. Did not want to play on this even at home, and uh, that was probably uh, you know that's that's good coaching on Jimbo's part because Ole Miss had uh, everything offensively that they needed to beat them. And uh, with A&M, of course, you know, uh, in the top five, uh, you know, they didn't want to risk losing to Ole Miss at home. That's my opinion. And uh, uh, so I think Ole Miss, you know, they can put an upset. They can spring an upset here or there. It may not be at Alabama, but, uh, you know, they're going to give them a run for their money. Hey, David, uh, speaking of winning games, uh, one of the big news today out of SEC media, uh, media day, uh, the commissioner, um, he said that uh, COVID forfeits are, um, you know, they're on the table for the SEC as vac- uh, vaccination rates, uh, the totals lag. Uh, they will not, they will not lead to rescheduling games. So, you know, um, he was saying that, you know, you need these players to get vaccinated or, you know what, we're going to have forfeits. I, I'm not really sure that, you know, these are young, healthy athletes. Um, you know, there's very little chance that COVID is going to affect them. Of course, you don't want to pass it on to anybody else. But I don't know. It just seems like uh, it's going too far with this, trying to, you know, not re- – I, I think they should have an opening to reschedule games. So um, instead of forfeiting them, I really don't like that. We've seen a lot of big sporting events uh, forfeited. You saw NC State had to forfeit their chance at the national, uh, uh, you know, the NCAA baseball championship. We we saw the University of Michigan forfeit its chance at an NCAA hockey championship. I, I just think you're sending a bad message and putting pressure on kids to getting a vaccine where, you know, it, it, COVID's not really going to affect them. It's rare, rare to none. Well, you make a good point. I, you know, I do have a friend from my hometown of Sulphur whose twin sons got COVID. Uh, one of them was a, an honor student on Louisiana Tech, and he died from it. Oh, and, no. And so I know that, you know, there are, and, and had no underlying conditions, you know, so I know there are cases. We were very fortunate in 2020 that we didn't have anything like that happen. You know, I, my concern is really for the coaches, too. Uh, you know, and now we have this new variant going around, and and uh, so we're just going to have to to see how all that works out. I wasn't aware that they'd made that uh, decision to, to forfeit games if you have, uh, you know, if you have infections. I did not know that. I saw that. Arkansas was saying that 80% of their players are vaccinated. And so I guess that's what we're going to be hearing from everybody from here on out is how many, what percentage of their players are vaccinated. And as you say, yeah, this is, this is one way to push everybody to vaccination. And, uh, you know, right or wrong, you know, who knows? But, 
You know, it looks like it's the way that it's going to be this year. I know last year they did everything they could to try to reschedule the game. You know, uh, A&M came back and one of their games that had been uh, postponed, you know, they ended up playing it. They just didn't have the open date to get the Mississippi game in. So uh, I don't know why they're getting away from that, uh, you know, that, that, that type of scheduling. I don't know. Right. Well, we're going to find out anyway. I mean, there's so much uncertainty still coming into the season in regards to COVID. Things are flying. We're going to get a full season, et cetera, but there are going to be some adjustments along the way. And my point was I'd rather have them reschedule games than go the forfeit route. David, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Great job. We'll have to have you back on again as we get closer to the college football season. Friday, this coming Friday, live on Blog Talk Radio, uh, blogtalkradio.com, 1347-205-9631. We'll have Evie Van Pelt on publisher of the Rebel Walk, and she will be talking about SEC Media Day, and I can't wait for that. Can't wait to stuff that she learns uh, from Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, who made those comments today about court, uh, possible court COVID forfeits and et cetera. Guys, thanks a lot. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. We'll talk to you Friday, Friday at 1 p.m. live Eastern, Blog Talk Radio, 1347 205 9631. For Todd Quarter in Atlanta, for JJ in Atlanta, for Wayne in Memphis, and for our guest. David Walker, thank you for joining us today. We'll talk to you then. See you Friday. And again, check us out on YouTube at ATL Prime Sports.